Hello and welcome to another edition of Telescope Man. We're here tonight. Uh, I've got a lot of requests for folks asking me how I go about setting up my little uh, ETX right here. This happens to be an ETX uh, 125 PE and I'm going to explain uh, both its operation to you and if you happen to have a plain Jane ETX 125 uh, and again I'll explain that the differences to you in a minute uh, if you happen to have one of those I'm going to use this scope like it was uh, a non PE type scope okay so that those of you that don't have this particular model uh, but still have the 497 hand controller right here okay and how do you know it's a 497 hand controller well it's got buttons on it with numbers okay that's one way to tell that you have a 497 of course it reports that when you turn it on so the first thing it's going to give you is the uh, um, version number of the software that happens to be in here and you can tell from that that it is a 497 hand controller but the key difference is the 494 uh, does not and then the regular little right ascension declination control that comes with some of these scopes that haven't been upgraded does not have this keypad it'll have some direction controls but it won't have the keypad so this demonstration tonight is going to be for those of you that happen to have a mead scope with the 497 controller on it I'm going to try to broaden the uh, base of the uh, explanation by trying to include several different types I'm going to try to include like this LX90 that's behind me over here because it uses the exact same uh, hand controller as this little uh, ETX125 it's exactly the same now if that hand controller on that bigger LX90 ever died I could switch this one to it and use this one but I would have to retrain the LX90 with this hand controller to reteach it the training for the gear backlash that this contains already for the little ATX 125 here when you do a training uh, it puts those parameters inside this device and uh, that device is kind of married to the scope that it's attached to so if you ever move these around between scopes you're gonna have to retrain it again and do a calibrate motors before you do it so uh, and then train it and then it'll be okay with the scope that you have it plugged into so let's with that kind of an introduction let's start at the beginning I'm gonna assume that you have either an ETX 90 an ETX 125 or an ETX 90PE or an ETX 125PE or maybe this LX90 that's behind me now if you happen to be using an uh, LX200 it's got a different hand controller some of these commands are different between the auto star 2 hand controller and the 497 so some of this won't fit your scope if it happens to be an LX90 and you've got an auto star 2 or that brand new one there that has the astronomer inside that talks to you if you got one of those then this is not gonna uh, fit you entirely but some of the techniques that I use when I go set up those are applicable for a broad range of go-to scopes so without further ado as we normally say here on telescope man let's get into this 
So as you can see, I've got my 497 hand controller plugged into uh, this little ETX125 here. It's got a nice plaque on it from Dr. Clay because he did a supercharge on it here very recently. And boy, he did a great job too. Uh, the scope was uh, almost unusable before he got his hands on it. It had serious problems with the deck axis, the altitude was uh, had very bad uh, deck backlash that he actually had to do some machining to uh, during the supercharge to get it fixed. And of course, he re-greased all the gears. He took the entire tube apart and cleaned everything inside, Mara and the corrector lens in the front. He did that. Then he put it on an optical bench and recolumnated the optics. So you've got to have a optical bench to recolumnate these Maxutoff type scopes that are with the ETX90 or the ETX125. Do not take them apart and try to fool with them because you will not be able to collimate it unless you know somebody that has a optical bench. All right, so I've turned the scope on. Now, you must know that previously we've done a drive training on this scope. The scope has been trained. Okay, it's also uh, had a calibrate sensors. Now, now, why would it have a calibrate? What is that? Let's kind of show you some stuff on here. Well, the PE models have what's called a little LNT module. Level North Technology, a little module right here. And um, this little module has an accelerometer in it, and it's got a uh, compass in it. So it can find level, and it can find north all by itself uh, without you doing anything to it. Okay? So... There's a couple of things that you have to do in order for this to work accurately. First one is to calibrate motors. And I'm going to do a calibrate motors right now so you can see it. So let me jump into the hand controller. Uh, <clears throat> select, select setup. And I'm going to run up until I get to telescope. And then I'm, I hit enter and I click a few more buttons and it says calibrate motors. So now keep your eye on this scope. It's going to be very fast. All right, it only takes a few seconds. Watch what it does. Here we go. Okay, it made a slight motion you know, to the right, and then it made a slight motion up. What it was doing was testing the current that's coming from this separate power pack right here that I'm running the scope off of. It was testing it and testing the motors and kind of getting those two things in sync. The very first thing I do every time I take a go-to scope out, whether it's this one or whether it's the L LX90, is I do a calibrate motors the first thing when I turn it on. And that just gets the motors and the power supply into sync. You should always use a separate 12 volt power supply like I've got here and not the internal batteries. This thing goes crazy when the battery voltage drops below about 60%. And it'll start giving you very weird errors okay that nobody can diagnose and that's why we always say are you using a separate well charged uh, power source or are you using the little triple a batteries that go in the bottom of this because when they, they drop in voltage this goes crazy all right and basically i've never put batteries in the, inside this scope 
you leave those batteries in there, you take a chance they're going to leak. And when they leak, they're going to leak all over the circuits inside and your scope will be ruined forever, okay? Don't use the internal batteries. Get out there and buy yourself a $39, $49 uh, car starter battery with the clamps on it. You know what I'm talking about? Your car dies out and there's this little battery pack you can hook up to the car battery and get your car started. Most of those have a 12-volt uh, uh, cigarette lighter style plug on them and you get yourself a special cable with that type of plug on it okay special cable down here with that kind of plug on it and uh, plug it into the power pack and then plug it into the control panel on the scope another caution to all of you is never ever unplug cables this cable, that ca any cable, with the scope turned on. You are playing Russian roulette that the ground wire actually makes contact first before the current wire. Okay, that's what you're doing. You're playing Russian roulette every time you do that. One, one day you're going to plug it in with the scope turned on and you're going to burn out the power board in this telescope here. So never unplug these cables anywhere with the scope turned on. Plug them in and turn the scope on. All right, so we've done a calibrate motor. So let's pretend I am going to use this scope tonight. Okay, I'm going to use this ETX 125PE that has this automatic alignment on it. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put this control panel roughly facing west. Roughly. I'm not going to get out of compass. I'm just going to see where the sun went down and kind of make this control panel be pointed toward the west. All right. Then I'm going to rotate this scope all the way gently over to the hard stop. All right. And there's two instructions I've seen from Mead. One of them is that's the home position at the hard stop. The other one is with the deck axis over the control panel, all right, which is slightly uh, clockwise from there. I'm not that picky about it. There's a bunch of play in this scope when it rotates okay so you don't have to be that accurate with a 125 turn it to the hard stop and you know we're almost to the hard stop see i haven't quite gotten to the hard stop and that's good enough i've never had it run completely around and around and around to the other hard stop and jam up never has happened okay never so just get it right there by the hard stop or almost by the hard stop you'll be okay so at that point <clears throat> if you're going to do an automatic alignment with this thing make sure that your uh, azimuth is tightened down but not too tight you'll break it and also your altitude knob is hand tight but not too tight or you'll break the knob off the screw that it's molded into all right there's a fix for that but then you got to go out there and, and try to figure out how to fix it there is a fix for it all right so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to select setup align it's going to give me a few choices you know easy align one star two star or in this case automatic all right so I'm going to choose automatic. I'm going to hit enter. All right. It's telling me to put it in the home position. Well, I already did that. All right. It says put it in the home position. I did that already. There it is. Notice the scope is not level. It's kind of pointed up. I didn't check the level of this base. I didn't get a, a bubble level and check that this tripod was level. I didn't do that either. Now normally, 
when I set up outside and I'm not sure of the floor or anything, I'll uh, go ahead and check the level. But I'm probably being overly cautious. You really don't have to with these PE scopes. Now, certainly if the scope was on a hill or something and obviously way out of a line, I would try to eyeball it and get it kind of uh, level. All right. But don't fuss over that. So I'm in uh, the home position. I hit enter again. And now this scope is going to try to level itself all by itself. And there it goes. So it's finding its own level. It's going to do a little dance here for a few minutes. So just keep your eye on it and see what it does. Now it's turning. By the way, north is that way. So it's going to spin around here. I didn't even bother setting it up with the control panel to the west. Okay, I didn't do that. Control panel is pointing roughly south right now. Okay, roughly south right now. I didn't even do that. Um, but it's just good form that when you do physically set it up, set the control panel to the west, you'll find that the scope uh, in the home position is kind of pointing west, kind of, and uh, it won't have to travel very far to get over to north. See, right this time it had to go 180 degrees to get there. Didn't make any difference, but I just like to do it the other way. And now it is re-leveling itself once it got on the other side of uh, the uh, slough. And it's checking its level, and it's checking the tilt of the scope. Now, it's uh, <clears throat> doing a little more checking on tilt over this way. I get a kick out of watching it when I'm out in the field observing, and you know, people see me push the button, and it starts moving all by itself, and they start asking me questions about what, what is it doing? You know, well, then I show them, I usually show them this screen, and say, see, it is finding level right now. It's going to make sure it's level. All right, so it's just about done, and now it says it's selecting a star, and since I have Dick Seymour's patch in this hand controller. I did a firmware update using Dick Seymour's patch. You can find his patch on the internet, S-E-Y-M-O-U-R, Dick Seymour. Uh, it also told me it was looking for Sirius, the star Sirius. Normally it wouldn't tell me that, it would just say slew into the first star and you'd have to push the question mark button down here to find out what star it was actually uh, trying to look at. But with Dick's patch, it reports it automatically. So now uh, I'm going to assume that it is pointed uh, toward that star and that's about the general direction it would be in right now. So I'm going to press enter. Now normally, you'd look through the eyepiece, you'd see the star, it's very, very bright. It's bright. That one happens to be the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere, so you can't miss it. And I would center that star and then push enter. But lots of times I do this, which is called a fake alignment, and I just push the button without centering the star. And the scope is so well trained and calibrated that it will find an object or get very, very close to the object um, without actually centering the stars because it's so well calibrated. Okay, now it's at Capella. That's the general direction that Capella would be in in the night sky. I'm just going to press enter again. And it says alignment successful. So let's test it. It defaulted back to object. So now I'm going to select, uh, let's see, is it late enough yet? Yeah, it might be. Uh, 
might be. Let's try for uh, M42. That's going to be up right over here somewhere. All right. So we're going to select uh, a deep sky, uh, deep sky object, and it, and then we're going to select a Messier object, and we're going to type in N, uh, 42. 42. That's the number of the Great Orion Nebula, the Messier number. I'm going to hit enter. Here's what confuses a lot of beginners. They'll hit enter and it says Messier 42 and nothing happens. And they look at this and they look at that. They look at this again and they hit enter again. Nothing happens. You got to press the go to key. <laughs> and once you press the go to key, it slews over to M42, which is the Orion Nebula. And there it goes, and it appears to be headed in the right direction. And Pretty close to where it's supposed to be. All right. Pretty close. Now, if, if it's not exactly there, when I do a fake alignment, if it's not exactly in there, I've got a tell rad. You notice this big old thing on the top of it. I hate this finder scope that comes with the ETX. I hate it. Okay. It's covered up right now. I never use it. All right. I mounted a regular Telrad specifically uh, to do alignment and to possibly use a star hop with, okay? So I just stuck a regular Telrad on top of it. So I use this big red dot finder instead of this, uh, they call it a smart finder, I call it a dumb finder, all right? The smart finder instead of that which I never use, okay? I mounted a different red dot finder on it. So, if I find that the fake alignment didn't quite get me there, on the very first object, I'm, I will manually center it using these buttons, up, down, left, right, all right? On the hand controller, these four left, right, up, up, down buttons. See them right there, okay? All right. And uh, another little trick, if you'll press a number, the bigger the number, the faster the scope will slew. Okay, so if I press the number, I usually use a five or a six, all right? So if I press the number five and I hit the right, you guys probably can't see it moving because it's moving so slow, I can see it here. Now let's press the number nine and do that again. See, much faster. So the little numbers control how fast you can turn it left, right, up, or down. And let's go up, see. So very fast at number nine. Five is a much better number to use to try to center something because it doesn't flash by the eyepiece when you're looking there. It moves across kind of slow, all right? So five or six would be my recommendation for centering objects, okay? So we have found Messier 42 with this scope, and uh, that is typically how I would set this scope up at night uh, for a star party or for a public observing event. I, you know, we set up during the daytime. I hate to get to a star party and it be dark outside already. I like to get there before dark, set up, hour before dark, set up, let the scope uh, climb it to the temperature, give it an hour to temperature adjust. It's got a mirror in there. It's got a adjust a little bit for better viewing. So I get all set up and when the sun is kind of down around the horizon, 
I'll execute a fake alignment just like I did. I can't see any stars yet. There's no stars up and I just push the buttons. Then when the very first star pops out, not a planet, don't do this with a planet, okay? The planet's orbits in here are calculated unlike the star field, okay? So if you try to sink on a planet, you'll basically mess up your uh, alignment, okay? You'll mess it up, all right? So what I do is, let's, let's suppose I've got M42 now centered in this eyepiece, okay? But, you know, it wasn't quite there when, when it made that slew. It wasn't there, all right? It was not there, and I had to move it. I had to look through my telrad. Oh, yeah, there's M42 right over here. And move the scope manually. And now I've got it in the eyepiece. So if I've got it in the eyepiece now, what I can do is I can hold down the enter key for two seconds and release it. And it beeped at me. It says enter to sync. And I press enter again. And now it has synchronized on M42, synchronized on there. So that will refine the alignment in this part of the sky. Okay, in this part of the sky, it's going to refine the alignment. It's not going to refine the alignment back this way or over here or over there. This part of the sky. So. If you plan your observing events, you know, from left to right, or, or, you know, low to high, or however you want to do it, you can sink your way across the sky using this technique. All right, so I'm good here, so, you know, maybe next I'll move to Rigel, a little bit further west, all right? And I'll sink on that. Well, that gets me good over here. And then I move to something else. Sink on that. And I can actually work my way around the sky, sinking on objects in that part of the sky. And then I'm pretty accurate there. But this requires you to know what's up there and what you want to view that night. So y'all have always heard me talking about the software program RTGUI dot, uh, at rtgui.com. Let me say that slower. Go to rtgui.com and download the free software there and install it on your machine. And it will print you an observing list, okay, that shows everything that's up there. Select a few items that you think you'd like to see. Then refer to a star chart and figure out how you can uh, look at them in order. All right, in order. You just got to plan 15, 20 minutes before you go outside. All right, and then you'll have a list of objects to look at. So for a PE model with this little LNT module, it's great. And I know some of you are saying, well, does it have a GPS in it? No. And uh, personally, I wouldn't give you $20 for the GPS that are inside telescopes, but that's just me. If you move around a lot, a lot, you'll appreciate a GPS. But the only entries I have to make with this it has a clock in there already. It does have a clock, so it keeps time and date already. It does not keep sight. It will only keep the last sight that you were at. So, you know, if I'm always observing right here, it's going to always remember right here. If we move to a school across the metro in Dallas, we move somewhere else, and uh, if it's more than about 
15 miles, 20 miles, I, if it's more than, then I will find out the zip code of the school that we're going to. That's all I need to know, the zip code. And I can change the site in here. That's my only change I have to make is what's the zip code where we are? And I enter the zip code and now the scope knows it's in a different spot. So a lot of times I'm up and running and I'm observing my first object while the guys with GPS's in their mounts are waiting for it to get a satellite lock. All right. So that's why I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not for a GPS. Their only advantage is, is if you move great distances all the time and, um, you know, it knows the time and the date and the site once you get there. But you got to wait for the satellite links. And sometimes uh, there might be something blocking you might be some trees or buildings or something or where you're at that block the signal and it'll take a long time to get a lock. So anyway, it's a great little scope. If you can find a ETX 90, the 90 works exactly, the 90 PE works exactly the way I just showed you, all right, without any change. It works the same way. If you can find a 90 or a 125, they're very portable, uh, very easy to carry around uh, out into the field. You know, I can actually pick this whole thing up and walk outside with it. All right, walk outside with the whole thing, just pick it up. Set up in just a very few minutes. So they're very neat little scopes. And I did have a 90 before this, but I upgraded to the 125. I just wanted a little bit more aperture than the 90. Okay, so I traded up to a 125. But it's about the right size for public observing school events. I can set it up like, what's really cool is I can set it up like this with the tripod legs all the way down and little kids can walk up and look directly into the eyepiece. Let me uh, turn it off and I'll kind of show you that a little bit. Okay, so, you know, here's the eyepiece right here. So a little kid that's this tall can walk right up to it and look in it. That's really neat. You don't have to worry about step ladders. I bring one anyway. Okay, a little two-step step ladder. But normally, the kids in grade school can reach this eyepiece when, it's, when the tripod legs are all the way down. And if I have adults, I just raise up higher. And it's very convenient. That's the neat thing about Maksutov and Smit Cassegrains, like this LX90, uh, is that the eyepiece remains in a comfortable position regardless of where it's pointed. So let me give you an example of that. <clears throat> so let's say it was pointed up at zenith, okay? And there's the eyepiece right there. And now we've got an object that just came over the horizon and there's the eyepiece right there. See, it only moved a few inches up or down. Now, of course, it's going to spiral around, you know, to the other side. But those of you that have equatorial mounts know that that eyepiece can wind up, you know, underneath the telescope pointed toward the ground. And you're going to need to rotate the tube around with some special rings in order to get the eyepiece back where it belongs uh, so that you can look through it comfortably. But these type of scopes in alt as position, this is alt as, alt uh, azimuth, altitude and azimuth, up and down, left and right, okay, in that configuration 
are very friendly as far as eyepiece placement goes. The eyepiece is always in a very neat spot and easy to get to. Okay, so let's uh, change up a minute. And now we're going to pretend that it is not a PE model with this LNT module on it. It's a standard ETX-90 or a standard ETX-125, but it does have the 497 controller. All right. It does have that, but it doesn't have this little module. We're going to have to do a couple of other things that are a little bit different. Again, you're going to have to rotate it around to the home position. All right, all the way around to the home position. And then again, back to where the deck is. You know, the deck knob is over the control panel. That's one way I've read that Mead wants it. And the other way is all the way to the um, hard stop. Okay, but either way, again, this is not going to make that much difference, even with the regular one. You want your control panel to be pointed west for sure with the standard models. Okay, so let's pretend that control panel is pointed west right now. All right, it's going to want me to. Um, in that case, the hard stop would probably be right about there. If this was west, this way, was west, that hard stop on those is in a different position. It's in a different place than it is on the PE model. And when you turn it to the hard stop, it's going to be about right like that. So I'll always turn the knob just slightly around and lo and behold, the tube is already pointing roughly north. Okay, so that's the second step. This tube has to be pointed north roughly. And the closer you get it to true north, the closer the two alignment stars will be. But don't spend a whole lot of time doing that. Just get a compass, get it lined up as close as you can to true north. Don't forget your magnetic deviation. The deviation here is about four degrees. All right, so you're not going to be exactly pointed in the exactly where the compass needle is pointed. In, in my, where I live, it's four degrees west. So, I would just estimate a little bit there and move it four degrees west. Right. Then I'd be pretty close to true north. Don't spend a lot of time with that because once you center the two stars, the initial north position uh, in Altaz mode doesn't make any difference. Uh, uh, centering the two stars corrects any north alignment errors you might have made during the initial setup. So let's pretend it's pointed north. I've leveled the tripod. Must do that. Without this module, you must level this tripod first. Then the tube needs to be level. So you put your little bubble level up here. And, you know, get that bubble right in the middle and lock it down. Lock down your uh, azimuth on the bottom. And now you're ready to go the same way I did, with, except you won't find an automatic alignment in there. You're going to do a two-star alignment. That's what you're going to do. And uh, you're going to need to center those two stars. All right. So let's talk the controller again a little bit. Turn this on. Let it initialize. And uh, 
again, the same controller would be being used. Exactly the same controller, this 497. It's no difference. Just a uh, few features in here are different, like this automatic that it's showing right here. All right. That won't be there. All right. Um, again, since this, since your model doesn't have a clock or anything, when you turn it on, the first thing you're going to do is execute a calibrate motors. First thing, calibrate motors on the power pack. All right. Then you're going to go about your business of making sure the tripod is level and the tube is level and pointed as close to north as you can once you calibrate motors. All right. You calibrated motors, it's pointed. Uh, in your case, hang on. <clears throat> in your case, I would just select a two star alignment like shown there and I would hit enter and again it warns me you know are you in the home position well yeah I'm in the home position hit enter again and it's now given me a selection of stars to pick a selection so Guess what? You can't align this unless you can pick out a couple of stars in the night sky by name. All right. These stars in here are always the brightest ones in the sky. It will never pick a real dim star. They're always the brightest ones. You just need to have a star map there and you need to be able to identify two stars that are fairly widely separated because the scope's not going to do it for you. You've got to do it. So tonight I would, you know, pick the same two that we saw, which was Sirius and Capella. All right. So let's run down through here. We're going to run down through these stars until we get to, if you hold down the down arrow key or the up arrow key scroll key at the bottom it goes through the stars pretty fast okay goes through them pretty fast so the first star we're going to try to get is Sirius and there it is and I hit enter and there we go now notice it's, make, it's going to spin all the way around there. It's going to make a slew all the way around and come back over here because it knows that the hard stop is the other direction. So it won't try to just come over this way. It'll run into the hard. It knows that. So it's going to go all the way around so it will not hit the hard stop. Yeah, just give it a minute, it'll swing around. Alright, and if you'll remember, it thought north was this way. Okay, we didn't actually set it up in the north, and that is about the position in the sky that Sirius would be, where it's pointed at right now. Alright, and then we're going to go to uh, hit enter, center it. Let me kind of show you this a little close up here. See, it says, it says center Sirius, Sirius and press enter. So I could be centering it right now. Left, right, up, down, center it. Uh, yeah, there it is. It's in the middle. All right. And I'd hit enter. And then it comes up and wants me to select another star. So again, I'm going to select another bright star. And this time I'm going to select Betelgeuse because Orion is up and I know Betelgeuse is real bright, can be easily seen. Okay, so here it goes to Betelgeuse, which is not that far away. See? 
probably not the best two alignment stars to use, but because uh, they're a little too close together, but should work okay. And it's found it, and I'd, I would have to center it. And there it goes, and it says alignment successful again. So that's really all there is to it. Now I want to remind you, this is the brains of these scopes. There's some circuits inside of this bottom of this base, but the actual computer is right here. All right, this is the computer. It's not in here. Same goes for the LX90. It's in here. It's not in the base of that scope, but there are circuit boards in there that you can blow circuits on, all right, inside. Meanwhile, on the LX200, the hand controller there is simply a dumb terminal. All right, it's a dumb terminal. That's all it is. The brains are in the base of the scope in the case of uh, LX200, all right? It's a little bit different. All right. Well, with that said, uh, <clears throat> let me give you a hint or two for training the drives. Very important function of any go-to scope is to train the drives. And what you're doing there is you are teaching the computer how much backlash these gears have inside this telescope so that it can correct for the backlash in the gears. You must train a go-to scope. All right. It's got to be trained. All right. In the case of the 497 hand controller, you've got to train it or uh, you could experience what we call rubber banding. And what that is, is you execute a go-to to an object, and you're looking in the eyepiece, and there comes the object, and it goes backwards. Might even go right, off, right out of the eyepiece. Right? Or you move the scope and put it back in the middle and it goes back again the other direction like it's on a rubber band. All right, doesn't stay there. All right. That just simply means you got to train your scope. All right. So one of the first things you should do after you read the manual a couple of times is to set up a target. You can do it inside if you have a long enough room so that you can focus on a target. All right, you can do it inside the house. I have a long enough path here down the hall and in through the kitchen that I can get a post-it note and I can draw a little dot on it for a target and I can stick it up on the wall, the very furthest wall, and I can use that as a target to train the drives. Now, if you don't have a room that's long enough and you can't come to focus, uh, inside the house, then you're going to have to take it out in the backyard and do the same thing on a tree. All right, you have to put a little target on the tree. Just get you a, a posted note, make a dot in the middle of it for the target with a marks a lot, and you can tack that up to a tree and use that as a target. All that training the drives is, and you can read about the routine in the manual. And actually, this walks you through it pretty good. When you enter the drive training part of the hand controller, is that it will ask you to center the target. And once you've got it centered and you press the button, it's gonna move off the target. First to the left, then to the right. All right, it's gonna move off the target. Later, it's going to move off the target up and down. All right. So once it's moved, let's say to the left, then it's going to say recenter the target. All right. And according to how much you have to move back is the backlash in those gears that it's going to compute. Never reverse direction 
when you are training the drives if you miss the target do not go backwards only go in one direction if you miss it sorry you're going to, have to start all over again that's the way it is just don't miss it all right slew back and stop when that target dot is in the center of the eyepiece again if you got a crosshairs eyepiece it'll really help you but it's possible to do this without a crosshair eyepiece so you don't absolutely have to have one uh, after you do it left and then right don't forget you've still got to do it up and down and the hand controller is a little tricky with that I've seen people train it twice all right in azimuth left and right they did it twice they never did it up and down all right so look at your hand controller and make sure that now you know you're finished with azimuth left you did it from the left and then you did it from the right now go in there and change it to altitude so you can do it up and down all right seen lots of people only train in one direction but they do it twice all right make sure you do uh, left right and then up and down when you train the drives and it's very good technique to calibrate the motors and train the drives with the same power pack that you're going to use at night outside the exact same one so again if you're going to train the drives what's the first thing you do when you turn it on i'm i'm going to train drives today well, we're going to calibrate the motors first we're going to run that routine and then we're going to train the drives All right calibrate motors first in the case of um, some odds and ends here in the case of a pe model with the lnt module on it periodically you've got to calibrate sensors okay you got to calibrate sensors it's just another routine in the uh, hand controller especially for the scopes that have this module on it and it, that routine does two things the first thing it does is it lines up this module to match the optical axis of the telescope so they're both pointed in the same direction electronically doesn't actually move anything it just calculates it all right and stores it in here so it lines up this module with the optical axis of the telescope so they're both pointed in the right direction the second thing it does is it calculates the magnetic deviation of that site so it does two things this enables the module to put the two alignment stars closer than they would be without a calibrate sensors closer notice I didn't say perfect but it's not going to still not going to be perfect you may have to move the scope a little, little bit to get the first and second alignment star in there but it will make it closer to the star and uh, if you've done a very good drive training especially with these LNT models you've done a very good drive training calibrate sensors very uh, good calibrate sensors which is done on the star Polaris very similar to training a drive except now it's going to use a star the NAR star Polaris to calibrate the sensors it's a very similar routine to training the drives if you've done all that very accurately more than likely your two alignment stars from then on will be within the field of view of a 26 millimeter eyepiece right. within the field of view of a 26 millimeter eyepiece maybe 
okay? So I encourage you to do those routines. And if you have um, an LNT model ETX90, ETX125, or this LX90, you need to do a calibrate sensors about once every four or five times that you take the scope out. So uh, let's say at least six months. About once every six months you need to recalibrate the sensors. All right. Why? Because for one thing the magnetic uh, field of the earth changes enough in that period of time that uh, it will make the two alignment stars be off. So uh, your magnetic deviation might have changed a uh, quarter of a degree or half a degree during a six month uh, time span. Here it's changing about a half a degree once a year where I live. All right. <clears throat> and it's actually getting closer it's actually going back the other way now. It's getting closer to being uh, exactly at the, uh, the magnetic being exactly the same as the true, uh, actual true north. So it's headed back the other way. So these numbers change. The Earth's magnetic field changes. So you need to do a calibrate sensors periodically just to get it back uh, in line with the current magnetic field of the earth all right so with that said i hope that helps some of you that have go-to scopes uh, <clears throat> one more caution again never plug or unplug a cable with the scope turned on all right so i'm going to reach over here right now and turn the scope off put that up and I'm going to show you one final thing before we go. And that's this neat little cable, power cable, that's sold by scopestuff.com. Here's the little cigarette lighter plug that goes into the appropriate 12 volt plug thing right here all right and then the other end of it has the appropriate power plug for this telescope just so happens that this works on this scope and that scope back there because they're both needs but it will not work on a celestron scope so this plug is not the right size. This little plug isn't the right size. The current is just fine. The 12 volt current, but the little plug is not correct. So you got to buy the appropriate power cable for your scope and mount. Okay. They're not very expensive. I encourage you to have two. Because you never know when this is going to break in, when you're out in the field and you're dead in the water. All right. So buy yourself an extra power cable that you carry around with you. And then another neat thing that scopestuff.com sells is this cable. If you'll notice, it's real flexible. The mead cable is like it's on a piece of steel. I mean, it's so tight and so close to the scope, you can't. And it puts a lot of pressure on these uh, uh, plugins because yeah, the cable's so tight. I've had two mead cables fail for no reason whatsoever, all right? None. I've had this scope stuff cable now for about three years all right, with no problems at all. It's much more, uh, it's much stronger built than the mead cable and it's much longer and much more flexible. All right, so 
go to scopestuff.com and buy yourself a couple of appropriate the right ones for this hand controller 497 hand controller ETX LX90 this cable will work on that scope too all right for this a lot longer doesn't put any pressure on this control panel right here so, all right doesn't it's not pulling on it real hard you know it's very very nice very loose and I can walk around a little bit with the hand controller away from the telescope if I need to okay how do you attach it well I've always done velcro see the velcro that I stuck on the back of that case and there's some on the legs I put one on each leg so no matter where I am I can just stick it on the leg and it stays okay I can be on wherever I am it doesn't matter I just stick it on a leg and it stays so buy yourself some commercial velcro and let me show you that I got this at a uh, auto parts store okay and this is a commercial type velcro all right real heavy duty the stick on the back the stuff that sticks is real heavy duty you know you buy the cheap stuff at dollar store and uh, it basically falls off because the glue on the back doesn't stick well enough all right buy yourself some good velcro uh, home depot i'm sure has it and uh, Lowe's and your local hardware store good velcro and put it on your legs and on the back of the hand controller and then you got a spot to put your hand controller uh, basically instantly all right don't hang it off the scope you know just dangling in midair again that puts a lot of pressure on the connections all right, be sure you treat it gently and don't drop the hand controller. That's the brains of the scope. That'd be like you dropping your laptop, all right? So with it, without further ado, I'd like to wish you clear skies. Call this one a take. And I sure hope that this has helped you uh, with your astronomy hobby. And remember, keep looking up to see the greatest show on earth every night right over your head. <laughs>